you guys. I have one more thing I want to talk to you. How are you doing? Well, first of all, how are you doing with all this material? Slowly getting somewhere? Very good. I hear the yeses. Um, um, if you're having your studies, I want to point out in your canvas. There's canvas. If you go to the um, one of the muscle tabs where I talk about the muscles, I have some pro study tips in there. And they're, they're, they're pretty helpful depending on what you want. I have one that I like if somebody wants to, likes to learn with flashcards, which I promote to do, is there's one called Muscle Picture for Flashcards. And if you go into the Dropbox there, it, it, you bring it up and it shows you muscles. This is the Peg Meyer, see that? So you can cut that out or label it or whatever you want to do with it. But that's, that's pretty positive, pretty nifty. Some students seem to like that over the years. And then the other thing that I think is really cool, I made that for myself in my office on my phone that I have a picture that I can blow up or on my iPad. And this is, you have to have it electronic and blow it up, but this is pretty much every muscle you need to know for all your school career. Unless you become an orthopedic surgeon, but I'm Is that on not canvas? That's on canvas, yeah. And you can download it. It's not it's not good to print it out because it's too small. Yeah. But you can zoom in and you can see we talked about we haven't talked about that. See we talked about the trapezius. Then you see all the attachment sides and then there's a line and you can really visualize where the muscle goes. So that's a pretty neat but you know, you go through them and you want to visualize it better. So that's one that seems to help, helps me a lot. Um, and then the last thing that I've done also quite a while back now is I have on, this is through Dropbox, these are all cadaver videos. So every little muscle, not, not every, but pretty much every muscle, I chopped out and I, I, I created all these videos and they're like, you know, 20, 30 seconds long, they're not long. But this guy is, you know, in his very boring way explaining the shape and the rotator muscles. Each short rotator. Oh, this is wrong. It's a bad muscle to choose, but you know. Oh, sorry, shoot. But you can sort of see what I mean, you know. But it's very, very bored. But it's very good use that way. Um, so that's a that's the third thing here that I put up that kind of helps with visualizing these muscles a little more, if you're interested in that. All right, so. The third column, we go down, that's the facial. Then we have the trunk muscles. And now we're going on the last line, we're on the last column. And we're going about halfway down. That's what we're doing today. And that's the upper extremities. First we do those, and then next week we do the lower extremities. So when I look, at these things, these muscles, I look at them um, as groups as much as I can. And so I ask myself the question uh, in, the, in, the, in the upper extremities, I, I have a few questions. One of the questions is, who anchors the shoulder blade to the trunk? Because if I look at, if I look at the upper extremity from a skeletal perspective, the only the only joint, the only joint that attaches this from bone to bone joint is right here. That's not a strong joint. That's not going to do much. Everything's going to fall down if I... Oh, I dropped it too. If I don't attach this shoulder blade with a lot of muscles onto the chest. And so I want to look at the muscle groups that do that. Who anchors that shoulder blade to the chest? That's scapula. And then I'm gonna to have to have muscles that bring this that bring this arm into the into the shoulder blade because again this is not much not holding that well. It's not like a really strong firm joint. Obviously, because we need a lot of motion here, we need to be able to do that. We could do that with a shallow joint, but that means we need muscles that and we have a set of four muscles that hold the arm, the humerus, into the scapula and anchor it or attach it. So that, that's another set of muscles. And then we can start moving the body around. Then we're going to figure out what kind of motions do we need on the, on this, on this, on the shoulder joint. And who's moving that around. So we have a few muscles to do that. And then we have elbow. And then we have a little wrist. A few things on the wrist. 
And so we look at the muscles from that functional perspective. So the first ones that I like, that's the overview pictures. The shoulder anchors. I got a few that anchor the shoulder um, from different angles. Wait, I'm up here now. So first one that shows up is a muscle on top of the shoulder blade that goes into the neck. It's known as the levator scapula. And it's on your list. Oh, it's a very important muscle, but it's not going to be on the test because you can't see it. It's below here. If you take this top layer off, which is the trapezius, it's below in here. And it, it pulls the shoulder blade upward or it lets the shoulder blade hang down, and so that's that much. It's a very thick muscle, it's really strong. If you feel your shoulder blade at the corner up here, it's probably a little stiff. And that's that, it's a very thick muscle. So I call this muscle the boss is mad at me muscle. Because it's usually one I guess really tight in, in people that are stressed out. So that's that um, one that anchors the shoulder blade upward. And then below that on the medial border, of the shoulder blade, I have some that pull the shoulder blade medially into the spine. Again, we can't see them on the models, but I want you just to visualize how we have now a muscle that holds the shoulder blade here, and then two muscles or a set of muscles that bring it this way and hold it this way. Pull it inward and upward. And so that's pretty good in the back. So that's what we have in the back. Then we got the Trapezius is overlaying that stuff. We already talked about a trapezius. Uh, but now when we look at when we look at a function, now we're looking at the function from the scapula's perspective. And so the trapezius is also overlaying the rhomboid and the levator on top here, and it moves the scapula around. Oh, okay, so it also pulls it a little bit this way. It's an interesting also, look at that, it does. Raises, retract, stabilize, all that, it does all that stuff. And again, the most superficial muscles do all the motions. They, they help the motion patterns the most that way. So is that a synergist muscle, the, the trapezius for raising? Yes. Yeah, the trape it's interesting, the trigger points in the trapezius are really the ones here on top that form a pattern that go into the front here as a pain pattern. And then the, you've got the levator that's really deep, and you can really dig into that thing. And it's not you're not grabbing at the spot grip; you're more like pushing into the scapula, so it's deeper. You can see how it's like it's much deeper, but it's thick. It's like it's not doing it justice to visual. It's, it's hard um, to to really visualize how thick that thing is. See the pattern of the that's the classic trapezius headache. Somebody comes with you and says, hey, I say, I have a headache here. Do you really go with your fans and use a family member or so? You can work a little bit. Um, the levator is more like pain at the neighborhood where it's at. It's not a referred. It says it's rotates the glenoid cavity. What does that mean? Rotates the glenoid cavity? Yeah. 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 When, when, it, when it lifts this up, the rotation is center of rotation is around here, so it pulls the, sh the shoulder blade this way a little bit. So it pulls it down. This glenoid cavity goes down with that motion. Did you show us on the skeleton? Yeah. Well, it doesn't move, but I can visualize it. Um, when we, yeah, let me put that hang that thing on the floor here. When. We have a muscle attached here and close to up here. And this is, let's say, this is the center of rotation. You think it's like a wheel. When this pulls up, this goes down. So it rotates it like that a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Thank that's, you. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah, it takes a little visualization to get these, um, to, to understand some of these actions. And the trapezius, again, again, trapezius does a lot of stuff. It's, it stabilizes, that means it holds the shoulder blade, it raises it, it brings it back, it can visualize, it pulls it backwards, it brings it upward, it raises the, 
glano, if this pulls up here, then the glano, then the glano goes up. So if we have the, the levator scapula pull up here, so the glano goes down, but now we have a muscle that's attached here, and you can bring it up. So we have these. And yeah, those are ultimately synergistic motions or positioning motions in some ways. Because if you look at the function of raising your shoulder up, for example, doing that, some comes out of the humerus to the shoulder, but a lot of the rotation comes from the shoulder blade itself, that that rotates if I go to the upper motion patterns. All right? So that's, it's almost like a two-step process in some ways. It's, it's, it's remarkable what that body does that way. And then we have a, muscle, a couple muscles in the front. We have one that's the serratus anterior, and that muscle is attached on the underside of the shoulder blade and wraps around to the front and grabs these ribs like that and pulls that shoulder blade inward. And so when you do a push-up, when you, for example, your chest falls down or you, you want to hold your chest to the, the, your scapula to the chest, that's a really good muscle to contract. It glues that shoulder blade to the chest. You see it here, that scapula is it's flipped back like that here. And then you see on the owner's side where it attaches and then it goes into the ribs. And you see it in, in boxes, you see these thick muscles on the side of the rib cage. Those are those muscles. Serrated means serrated knife. The way, that, the way it looks, looks like a serrated knife. The way that they visualized it. That's why they call it that. So that's a really interesting anchoring muscle for the shoulder blade pulling it into the rib cage. And then we got, I think the last one here we got in the front is the pec. The pec minor attaches to the coral cord process here in the front and then brings the shoulder, that's shoulder blade, right? That front process and it anchors the, shoulder, anchors the shoulder blade anteriorly into the rib cage here. So that's, so that now we have a pretty good set. We got a few muscles in the back holding it. We got one in the front holding it. We got one on the side yanking it, pulling it straight onto the onto the chest. So that's pretty solid. So that's pretty good as a as a as it goes. So that's that's that first set of muscles um, there. The one no, I have all of them on there. I can. From a test visualization perspective, these are really all hard to do. We don't have models for it. We do have the serratus actually. Hold on. You can see the serratus a little bit on the side. If you look actually here, this is serratus right here on the side. You can see that serratus. And then if we get to the rotator cuffs, you can see more of that. So that's the next set of muscles is the rotator cuffs. And now we're looking at a set of muscles that hold the shoulder, the arm into the shoulder blade. Let's see, see here, we got these. So we have, we have muscles on the, on the back of the shoulder blade and on the front of the shoulder blade. So we have here, if you look at, at these pictures here, we have four of them all together, four of these, they call them rotator cuff, that holding the arm into the shoulder blade muscles, they are. We have, Back one, see the sky, the spine of the scapula? That's your orientation, that's back, that's in the back. So you can, that's what you can touch here, that's this puppy. And so we have them also on the top, we have them also on the bottom, we have a small one on the, on the bottom, bottom, and then we flip this shoulder blade over, we have one big one on the other side. So that's four. You learned the fossa above the, supra, the spine of the scapula is called the supraspinous fossa. The muscle in there is the supraspinous muscle. So that's where that stuff pays off, and you learn these landmarks well. Then you got the part in the, in the infraspinous fossa is known as the infraspinous muscle, spinatus muscle. Supraspinatus, infraspinatus. And then we got a small sliver on the side, and that's known as the teres minor. That's a, that word, you just have to study that one. We have a teres minor and we have a teres major. They sound the same, they don't do the same. We, we also had that pectoralis major in the front. We also gonna have a pectoralis minor in the front. We also will have a pectoralis major 
that uh, that doesn't do the same, but it, it's in the same location, and that's why we have the name. Um, and then the underneath one is known as the subscapularis muscle. Sub underneath, sub means underneath, like from submarine scapula and shoulder blade. So the under the shoulder blade bone, that's the subscap. So those are the four rotator cuffs. What they do is they come from these parts of the shoulder blade and then they go into the humerus. The ones in the back go into the greater tubercle and the ones in the, the one in the front go into the lesser tubercle. And so it pull, then it pulls that shoulder, that arm, into the shoulder blade. So you can see it on the bone. You see the top one, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. They go to the greater tubercle right here. And then you've got the subscapularis, and that comes to the tubercle in the front, and that's the lesser tubercle. And then uh, together they pull this show, this humerus into that thing. And that wears out. There's a lot of motion there. There's a lot happening there. A lot of flexibility in that joint. So those are, does that, that make sense, those, those muscles? Good. Good. Because then that covers those down the subscap. Then we get into, now we're getting into muscles that move, oh, these are all the individual pictures. Look at how pretty. I worked hard on these things. Now we're getting into the movers of the arm. So the arm, we want to move the arm. We want to bring the arm to the front. So we want to bring the arm, we want to bring the arm this way downward. So we got to have a muscle that's attached up here somewhere and and into the chest. So we have one that's on the top of the humerus and goes into the chest like that. It's attaching right here on top around the greater tubercle. What is it? Oh, it's actually the intertubercular groove. So in between the tubercle, something in between is inter. And so it's inter between the tubercles that groove is where that muscle starts. And it goes from there, and it covers all the way from the clavicle to the sternum, and then to ribs as well, all the way down. And what it does, it brings the arm inward, this way. So it's like, it, this is the motion it really does, when you, when you feel it. So you can, you can oppose the motion, hold on to something, and do that pushing down, and then you feel the muscle, then you feel the muscle bulge up. So that isometric contraction. It also brings the arm inward a little bit because it pulled the way it pulls, it pulls it inward a little bit. So it does this word a little bit too, but medial rotation of the humor. A very important muscle. Then we got the coracobrachialis muscle. Is that all there? Yeah, it's a few steps downward. The coracobrachialis muscle um, is also helps in adduction. It's a muscle that's again attached like the pec minor here on the coracoid process, and it goes forward, downward, into the top of the humerus. It also it it brings it inward a little bit, but this muscle brings the humerus up. If you think about it from here to here, pulling upward a little bit. So that brings in inflection a little bit. And when I look at the model here, so these models, let me talk about these models. These models are very delicate because they fall apart. They have, so they have rubber bands. So we have two rubber bands. We have one rubber band that holds the front to get the bottom here, you wrap them around, and then we got one rubber band for this top muscle. So I don't have to take the rubber bands apart yet, but the coracobrachialis, I see that right from in here going downward, the sliver of muscle going downward. So this is a left arm. So then you can visualize it if you have a muscle here. If that contracts, what would it do? Probably bring the arm up. That would be flexion of the arm. This is a small muscle. It's a hard one for us to feel that it bulges out. So it's not, any, you know, it's hard to feel that. Um, and then this, the next one we got there is the deltoid. So we did the pec major, we did, now we get to the deltoid. So we now bring the arm in, we flex it a little. Now we have one muscle that does all kind of different functions. It abducts the arm, is a main function, but it also brings it forward, it brings it backwards a little because you got a muscle here that's really thick 
on top. And it's attached from the back of the spine of the scapula all the way it wraps around to the front. What's interesting about this muscle, it's actually the same attachment on the underside that the trapezius has on the upper side and goes off. So it's kind of interesting somehow. It's like the muscle is one muscle and just had to stop there and it glued itself into this. And we now call it two muscles. Which brings me to another interesting thing. We now know a lot about fascia, or much more about fascia in the body. That's the white stuff. That's fascia stuff. We have a lot of thick bands in the back, for example. But all the muscles are connected with one another. And they create these fascia lines. And these lines are when we execute motions. It's like one muscle helps the other and pulls on it. And that's sort of also another system that kind of helps that movement apparatus. It sort of holds everything. It's sort of passive. You have that fascia system holding everything together. With, with rubber bands, kind of, it's a rubber band sort of system, and that way we don't just collapse into single bones and everything goes away like this would. But then we bring the muscle in, and the muscle is the functional part and contracts and moves things around. So we're learning this like individual muscle thing, but it's in reality it's very intricate how everything works together. It's, it's very cool. I mean, it's a very good way of studying it that way, but it's very cool. Um, the deltoid. Yeah, the main function we have is up AB duction, bringing it up. And then all the other ones. You can see it's three parts. You can see it here, it's three parts. Well, front, back, side, back. When I test it on patients, it's actually six muscles I test. So I have six different treatment patterns to activate them. So there is neurology comes to six different muscle parts. They just don't separate all of them. Because um, functionally speaking, um, and then we get to the latissimus dorsi. And the lati look at the difference between these guys and uh, this guy, the Phelps guy. It's huge. That's latissimus dorsi muscle. That's that inverted triangle. That muscle does what? It's crawling, the, pulling the down. That's that main stroke in, in freestyle. That's why this guy is so big. So that latissimus dorsi is all the way in the back, attached here, and then goes into like the got to be the intertubercular groove, I believe. Yeah, right? The one in the front, the pec. It's kind of like the pectoralis in the back, if you think about it. It also brings the arm in, but now in front of forward, instead of forward in, it brings it backwards in there. So it does this extension motion. But it does have that adduction and extension combination in there. And it also immediately rotates the humerus because where it's attached, it pulls it from the front. So when it pulls, it brings the humerus this way. Is that sort of sensible on the model? It's not on this model. Is that understandable from a functional perspective? Good. It's not on this model, but you know, it would be it it's this whole overlying back muscle. It's about this thing. It well it depends on how active somebody is, of course. Um, but it's pretty it's a pretty thick muscle. All right, so that's the latissimus dorsi, and then, and then this is where then the teres major comes in. We have the teres minor, and the teres minor is attached here, around here, going into the greater tubercle, and helps the rotator cuffs. But the teres major is a, a bigger cousin next to it, and it's kind of like a portion of the latissimus dorsi muscle just attached to the inferior border of the scapula and then goes all to the intertubercular inter groove. So that function is like the latissimus dorsi. So the teres mi major works like the latissimus dorsi and the teres minor is a rotator cuff muscle. And you see them here, you see how the, this is pretty good visualized on the model, you see how the teres major goes to the front and the teres minor goes to the back. All right, so I know that's a bit detail oriented, and in the test you just need to visualize it and, and name it. But with those kind of helping clues, then it's easier to figure out which one is which when it comes to that. Um, of course, I just find it very interesting, but that's the nerve talking over here. 
So that's pretty good for the shoulder, I mean for the arm. We move out, we move back in, we move to the front, we move to the back. We can bring it up this way, we're doing pretty all right. Now we can go and look at the elbow a little bit. What are we gonna do at the elbow? So we're gonna move the elbow, bending the elbow and then straightening it out, flexion, extension. We're gonna have a few muscles that do that. So that's pretty simple in that respect. So we have some muscles in the front that bring it, for, that flex it, and we have a muscle in the back that extends it. We have the biceps brachii in the front, and then underneath it, we have the brachialis. Wait, where is the brachialis? Over here. This picture is actually good too, hold on. So we have the brachialis down in here. So we have the top one, the one that you see easiest, has two heads. If you look at your model, you see how when you see now you can if you take this rubber band off, things will fall apart. Be careful. But you gotta take it and you just put it in the next one and then you can take this one out. That way you have something to hold. See this top muscle here? That's that's two heads on top. That's bicep. Bi means two. Bicep. Set means belly of the muscle. So it has these two bellies to the muscle. And so that's how you recognize that on top here, two bellies to the muscle. So the, the top belly, the short belly, goes right to the coracoid process. That's now our third muscle that goes to the coracoid process. So that's a pretty active site. And then the other portion of the biceps reaches underneath the intertub it goes through the intertubercular groove. So that's an interesting one to know. The muscle that goes through this groove on the bone here is the biceps muscle. The biceps brachii muscle to be specific. And then it goes right up into here. And so that, that muscle is pretty interesting. It's a pretty long muscle. And it does help with flexion of the arm. So it does do that, but the main function is at the elbow. So it has a couple of functions. Um, the other thing that's interesting, this muscle down here goes into the radial tuberosity. That's unexpected. So when we look at the bones, stay there. It goes, it goes into the, it goes into this bump, the radial tuberosity. It doesn't just go into here, it goes into this bump. And so what now happens if you have a muscle here going into this bump and you are palm down? This bump is down here. If you pull on that thing, guess what you're doing? You're bringing the palm up. So that motion, supination, is done a lot by the biceps brachia. So that's an interesting motion that is good to know. All right, so that's one of those muscles that does a whole bunch of stuff. Now, if this muscle does, look at that. This muscle does a little of this, does this, and does this. That's pretty cool, there's three motions. I didn't even put the flexion up here on, on the, on the, on the shoulder. But if you, if you think, you have to think that a muscle going into, into the shoulder, it's going to have to do some function up here. When you look at muscle, you look at which joints does it cross. And then you can understand the function on that joint. All right, so that's the bra brachia, the biceps brachia. And then the, underneath it is that brachialis muscle. And that thing goes, goes into the elbow right in here, and anchors there from here to here, and when that contracts, you just flex that elbow. That's all you do, flex that elbow joint. Very powerful muscle, very thick muscle, but it is hidden. Look at that, it's down here. But it is hidden by the top one, so when you do the curly things, you see the top two. You don't see the one underneath. So the brachialis muscle is the most powerful elbow flexor, actually. And then we got, look at this, this is why I make you study these body terms in the first chapter. We got another one with the word brachia in it. So we got biceps brachia, we had coracle brachialis, we have, now we have, and then we have brachialis, now we have brachioradialis. So that is a muscle that's deep at the, the bottom of the shaft, so that's almost at the elbow here. And then that muscle goes all the way down to the, to the wrist to the styloid, and it does this motion. It flexes the elbow joint because it's going right here, but it also does, holds it sort of the angle here. It holds it from the distal, so it holds the wrist a little bit off. 
So if you have something where you have to hold your hand and it doesn't just fall down this way, you're going to have this muscle activated here that holds it up as well. Brachioradialis is where we get tennis elbow. So a lot of injury, overuse injury, it doesn't have to be from tennis, but this muscle is pretty exposed to getting overused. Brachioradialis muscle. Cool muscle. You guys, yeah, it's a tennis elbow. Yeah, what you try to do is tennis and you try to compress down here and take a little pressure off of the ori origin in the humerus. It's kind of a weird feeling though. I thought it was, but mine gets, mine gets iffy. That's probably why I wear these sleeves to kind of give that muscle a rest when I don't push on people. It's back. So that's the brachioradialis. And then on the back side, and we can look at it on the skull here real quick. So it's right from down here, and it goes into the radial, you know, tubo, I mean, the styloid process in here. So it really flexes that elbow. I mean, that's this down here, sorry. Flexes this elbow fairly weakly, but then also brings the, brings the wrist into action. Holds it from the wrist. And then on the back, we just have the big triceps. So that's pretty neat. So that's pretty good. We go right here. We got three heads to it. It's kind of like the biceps and the brachialis combined. We got, um, and most of, of the, the attachments are going into the tubercle on the underside. So one of the muscle attachments goes into here, and then it attaches here, and then it attaches on the, on the humerus as well, the short, the short head. But what's important there, it goes, they all converge and go into the electronal process. So you gotta think, a thick band, a thick tendon right here goes into the elbow, the stuff that you can underneath the skin. And that that is the insertion of the uh, triceps brachii. And if you visualize it, you know, you extend your elbow. That's what you do with that. It's a very strong elbow extensor. It's like, no, it's, see, the extremities are reversed, so, right? It's kind of like the quad. It's the quad of the arm. Not the hamstring. That would be the biceps and the brachialis. So the flexor versus the extensor. Well, <laughs> we don't have to do these escapades. Sorry about that. Um, so that's the tricep. So now we can kind of leave, for the most part, the, the elbow joint. And we go to the forearm. And now in the forearm, we got, we got flexor extension again. We got a little disc going on, but we don't worry about that. But we also got pronation, supination going. So we already worked on supination. The one we work here in class is the, is the biceps brachii, is the supination. There is another muscle called the supinator muscle. We're not going to worry about that. All right? Because um, if you see the word supinator in a muscle, you probably suspect slowly that it might be a muscle named by its function, and you're going to look around here. Because that's where we do the supination motion. But the turning down, we have one, one thick, thick muscle that turns the palm down, and that muscle is right here in the forearm, going from the inside part of the forearm, the medial part, and then crosses over and reaches into, uh, into the radial side of the forearm, or the radius, sorry about that. So these pictures and the arm models are mirror images. That's always been frustrating. So the models are your left arm. So the muscle here that I'm talking about is this one right here. Right here, it's attaching to the medial epicondyle. You can feel that bump, that's the bump. That bump is the medial epicondyle, you feel that. And that's more or less where all that stuff starts. That goes forward and then down in the forearm. And the muscles that are in the forearm, for the most part, what they're gonna do is they flex it. Again, where they, they attach, they contract, most likely they do this motion, all right? But that first one that I have is actually here, and it goes from the medial epicondyle over to the radius, and it brings the arm downward, the palm downward. So that motion is pronation. And it's in the word. Pronator is a pronation is done by a pronator. Pronator tears. And we got four altogether muscles that we study in the forearm. One is that pronator teres. And then we got three other ones. They're all next to one another. 
And there's a lot going on in that forearm. So we're specializing on four muscles in the forearm. The four important ones, most important ones, I think. The pronator teres is one of those that pronates that or forearm. Then we got one muscle that goes down and sort of goes, you can see how the tendon goes to the thumb side. And then we got one muscle next to that that starts up here. You can see next to it, up here, the tendons go to the palm side. So the first to the thumb side. Now you see how the tendons go to the palm. Actually this here, that's that tendon that goes into the palm, straight down. And then next to it, on top here next to it, we got one on the side. You've got to ignore these coming out in between here, but the one here on the side goes all the way down to the pinky. And that's our fourth one. So when we name them, we have to name first one already, pronator teres. We'll go with that. Then we got two names that have the word flexion in it because they bend the wrist. That's flexion. And then the second word in their muscle name is where do they go? They go to the carpus, the wrist bones. So their name starts as flexor carpi. And then the third word is, where do they go? To the thumb side where the radius runs, or the pinky side where the ulna runs? And then you can determine if it's called ulnaris or radialis. All right? Is that sensible so far? From the, because these names can be intimidating. So you've got to slow it down and take them apart. And so what I can do is I can take my web of my right hand and put it right here at that medial epicondyle, or on my own, actually. But I can see my index, my index finger goes right down sort of along the pronator teres. Then my middle goes towards the thumb. That's the flexocarpial nares. Then my ring finger, we haven't talked about the ring finger yet. The ring finger's name is palmaris longus. So when you see that tendon goes all the way to the palm, you see this white stuff here? That's a band that holds the wrist together like that. That muscle is so superficial, it goes above that thing. When you do that, it's that thing right here. You can see it. That's the palmaris longus. 10% of the people don't even have it. So if you don't stick up, you might not have it. You just have to learn it. And so that muscle here is the palmaris longus. It goes into your palm. And then the last one is the flexor carpi ulnaris because it goes to the pinky. So there you go. You got these laying down like that. And then in chiropractic school, we work with a lot of mnemonics because you memorize all this gazillion stuff, like here too. Same thing. We call it the PFPF, pronated teres. Flexocarpial radialis, palmaris longus, flexocarpi ulnaris. That's a very good mnemonic for the test. Uh huh. Um, what is, it says wrist flexion. Yeah. Is that flexion and adduction and then adduction? I understand that this is flexion. We're in the, in the, oh, in the, in ulnaris and radialis? Yeah, what's, does that mean like this? This versus this. So the radialis pulls it all this way. So that should be AB abduction. Yeah, that's down here. Abduction is out. So that motion is abduction, and then this motion is abduction. So those are sort of smallish motions they also do. Yeah. All right, so that's actually one of the hardest ones for the whole thing. All right, these forearm muscles. So when we go around, I want to make sure we everybody I'll talk through and you all understand these, okay? Because, you know, I mean, depending on where you go with the next classes, but these are sort of the things that help because sometimes anatomy can be just very academic. And if it's just a list, you need a lot of these memorizations. I do at least, tools that I can get. And so that the way that's why I'm very on it, the way I teach the forearm muscles on the surface. If I go more superficial, more deeper, I'm going to get flexor muscles for the fingers. So I'm going to get flexor digitorum type muscle names, okay? So that's then the next level. And something for thumb and so forth. But the other ones that we learn is the ones on the backside. And if I go at, to the backside, I'm not now flexing the wrist, now I'm extending the wrist. I bring it up. So these muscles, generally speaking, start here on the outside. 
at the um, lateral epicondyle of the ray, of the humerus, sorry. And then they reach over and down, over and down. So when I look at the model, or the first one that I need to look at, and I think I should um, review the upper ones also. No, we did the upper ones pretty well, but the first one here, this muscle here, that's the brachial radialis. So that goes all the way up here. It appears to be a, a wrist extensor, but it's in the humerus where it attaches. It's all the way up top. So that's above the, me, the lateral epicondyle, and that goes into the lateral epicondyle. So we have a muscle, it's actually two muscles here. Group starts as one, and then you see the other one coming from underneath. And that muscle goes to the thumb side onto the wrist. And that's going to be called, instead of flexor carpi radialis, it's called extensor carpi radialis. And we got a longus and a brevis, but we're not worried about the longus and the brevis. We just call it extensor carpi radialis if I tag it here. What you do want to be worried about is the brachioradialis is the big one on top, sort of the dividing line here between front and back. And it's not, that's not the flexor. I mean, the extent, that's the brachioradialis. Then now next to it is the extensor carpi radialis. Okay? Okay. Good. And then we have to identify, there is a bunch of stuff going on here, but I'm only going to make you study the extensor digitorum muscle. And you can recognize that extensor digitorum muscle by again, it starts up here, and you see the tendons going to the digits, the, the fingers. So then that muscle is the extensor digitorum. And again, you can also just group it by like one, two, three area, and then the fourth one is on the side because you've got a lot of them too, but I'm interested in also studying the one that goes to the carpal on the ulnar side. So that would be the extensor carpi ulnaris. Yes, Nina? So the extensor digitorum is one muscle, but it has tendons that come out of the muscle into all Correct. fingers or just four? Four. The thumb so is separate. The thumb. the thumb is always its own, its own thing. Okay. Yeah, when you then go further distally, which we don't worry about, but in the in the distal wrist, the thumb and the the, the, the rest of the fingers, you look at, you separate those out. After the thumb has its own muscle, okay. and you have you know extenses. Most extenses are here in the forearm. In the flexes, you have more flexes that are also in the hand. You can see the palm of the hand is pretty thick. So you have that too. Okay, so I think that's enough. Did you guys, does, does that make some sense to you? Is there any questions?